Moment verstanden werden, dass dafür politische Unterstützung entsteht, mehrheitliche. Did you get that? Yes, <laughs> okay. So how shall people understand such relatively abstract and complex thoughts and the interchange between the system components? How shall humans understand all this and get political support for all this and then get majority political support for this? So it's a question about the relations of your graphs and formulas and, uh, you know, and democracy, basically. That's, That's a Deutsch antworten. Ich habe keine Idee. There may be, the next question maybe um, is also tough. These Germans. <laughs> Sie sprachen von Ethik, Kultur als einem Weg, das Problem anzugehen. Wie kann man eine globale Leitkultur, Sustainable Development, etablieren, wenn die kulturellen Unterschiede so groß sind? Arabien, China, Amerika, Europa. So the question is basically, how can you establish, I mean, are you even implying that? Are you implying that uh, there should be a lead culture that is global, considering the fact uh, that, uh, I mean, a lead culture that shows the way in ethics, Considering the fact that the cultural differences and the regional differences, differences between civilizations and religions, etc., are so vast between Arab, uh, uh, the Arab world and China, Europe and the US, can one even establish something like a lead culture that is relevant for everybody uh, in the world? I mean, after all, you know, uh, 1972, you used not a regional uh, formula, you used a world system. Is there something in terms of ethics that can establish a light culture, lead culture that is sustainable? Let me note parenthetically that we, we globally, we have two ways to adapt, genetically and culturally. That's, those are the two ways that human beings, genetic change takes thousands of years. It takes about 4,000 years for uh, a, a constructive, gene mutation through fairly widely in the population. So obviously we're not going to adapt to climate change and things like that genetically. The other is cultural. You change your adaptations, your institutions, your beliefs, your values, your goals, your ethics for personal, and so forth. Uh, that, that's what's open to us. I hope, and I'm quite confident, we're not moving toward a world with one culture. I wouldn't set out to try and define a culture that would work for everybody. Culture is specific to the peculiarities of a person, of a people's history, their natural resource uh, setting, uh, and, and many other things, the level of their material culture and so forth. So we're, we're rather moving in, in a different direction, I think, towards diversification. A hundred years from now, I'm confident that the cultures which we see around will be the cultures of sustainability because they're the only ones that are going to be left. Uh, but they will be very different from one place uh, to another. Gibt es den Beruf des Nachhaltigkeitsbotschafters? So somebody want, would need some help with his career or her career. Is there such a profession as a sustainability ambassador? Ambassador for sustainability. Is that a profession? Maybe works, we should make you the honorary. It works great if you're a retired professor and have a pension. But if you want to make a living off of it, I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the last, uh, the last one. Uh, uh, why can't we make every city as attractive as Munich? <laughs> I think we so, of course, some of these questions aren't serious, right? So I don't know if that one's a serious question. To get into this issue of urban attractiveness involves a, it's a fairly um, detailed and complex discussion because uh, you, know, you start thinking about the elements of attractiveness uh, and the different populations that they appeal to and so forth. I mean, uh, finally, all cities will be equally attractive unless you set up migration limits. Uh, you do. But within a common attractiveness level, you do have some choice over the relative constituents. You know, some cities may choose to become very attractive uh, culturally, 
but not very attractive uh, because of their job opportunities or the quality of their housing stock. So you do have some choice there. And that's actually one of the really profoundly important civic debates in a city is of all the different things that define an attractive environment, mm -hmm. which ones do we want to emphasize and which ones are we willing to let loose? It's impossible to make all of them more attractive than everybody else because if that happens, everybody moves in and you get pushed back down. But you can change the mix and that's a very important thing. Can I end, because I think we're coming to the end, with four questions that speak to ethics and, um, and sort of, yeah. The one is, in some developing countries, hunger and poverty is still a problem. How can people believe in sustainable development to be more important than food and water for survival? The other one is, what role does religion or faith play in supporting or hindering a positive future development? This one is, isn't a fundamental change of consciousness our only chance? What are your views about changing consciousness to bring about a sustainable culture? And then I'll end on this one. How did you manage not to lose hope over the decades? And I have two and a half minutes. You do. The problems I talk about, it's important to remember, are caused by behavior, not by attitudes. People often say, how can I change somebody's attitude? And, I, and I, my response is, that's not our goal. We need to change their behavior. One way to change people's behavior is by changing their attitudes, but that tends to be quite difficult and time consuming. There are other ways to change people's behavior. Uh, you, can, uh, you can declare that certain behaviors are illegal and that if somebody does them, they'll go to jail. Then, then by and large, they quit doing them irrespective of what their attitudes are. Uh, you can impose economic incentives or penalties. You know, so uh, if you subsidize uh, uh, childbearing, for example, you can if you pay enough, you can get somebody who basically wants to have only a two-child family decide, well, I'll have another one, uh, et cetera. So there are different ways to, to alter behavior. So that's what we're talking about here is behavior change. Religion, traditionally, well, of course, religion plays many roles in our human uh, society, but one role it plays is to put current actions into the context of longer-term consequences. Either celestial consequences, like if you do that, you won't go to heaven, or moral consequences, you know, don't do that because it's against the teachings of the whoever. Uh, religion can be phenomenally important it can also be incredibly destructive. I mean, it, if it is encouraging you to do behaviors which are sustainable, it can be very helpful. If, if it's encouraging you to do things which are violent or not sustainable, then it can be very destructive. And, and religion has played both roles uh, in human society over millennia. Uh, interestingly enough, at least interesting to me, uh, the Council of Churches was one of the very first organizations to express an interest in limits to growth. Uh, almost immediately, when even before the book came out, when word started to get out that MIT was working on this project, we got invitations from senior officials in the Council of Churches, which, as you know, is a, uh, an agglomerate, it's a sort of a coordinating council, to come and talk about these issues because they clearly understood that we were be touching on issues which had influenced uh, them and their uh, activities in the past. Um, <coughs> recently, I was uh, in Vienna, I was working with, uh, trying to think about this issue of sustainability and, and so the church came up and then I, I looked at the, the head of the uh, Catholic Church in Vienna at that time uh, was an incredibly conservative uh, person. And I 
I said basically, forget it. Uh, this is not a, a guy who is going to be interested in anything related to sustainability. Uh, but nonetheless, the church is rich and it's very important in Austria. So I, I didn't want to give it up. So I started moving down the hierarchy and it turned out uh, monasteries are actually an interesting place to talk about sustainable development because the head monk you know, has to buy all the food and all the energy and everything and it, you can make a case to them, an economic, not, a, not necessarily an ethical, but a, an economic case about sustainable development. So, so the religion is important along with other things. Uh, so I'm, I, I, you know, could go on link, but, but that's about religion. Um, consciousness. I think, I think I don't have more to say than my little story about two kinds of people reaching conclusions. And different. I mean, consciousness is the sum total of your assumptions and conclusions about things. It's the way you process information, and. Uh, we form those, it's important for us, all of us, to understand that those are formed in different ways. When I was 27, 28 years old and finished Limits to Growth and I came running out, you know, with, okay, here it is. Uh, I thought everybody would, you know, read my data and change their factors and change their conclusions and then that would be the end of this book. Nothing happened. So I came to understand it doesn't always work like that. Consciousness has many sources. And uh, that's all I have to say about consciousness. Uh, optimism, happiness. I'll, te I'll tell you two totally different things about that. Not, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm just it's sort of illustrating ways to think about this. One of my heroes uh, is Paul Ehrlich, an absolutely world-class biologist, a professor out at Stanford, who for decades has been writing about global problems. He's the one who wrote uh, with his wife Anne, he wrote uh, Population Bomb, which preceded uh, our work and certainly had an influence on it. Uh, and he's been very active since. And I was with him one time. I said, Paul, you know, how do you stay happy? You know, you keep talking about these global problems. Nobody does anything. Don't you get frustrated? And he said something which has actually been very useful to me. He said, you know, it's important. A, you got to stay involved because these things don't change quickly, so don't you know, do something and then just get discouraged and leave. That is no point. Uh, but create a part of your life outside of global problems. And Paul's area of life, besides, of course, his personal affairs, is that he's a butterfly specialist. He studies butterflies. He goes out in the field and I don't know what he does, looks at their feeding habits and their nesting habits and their, I don't know what, you do if you're a butterfly specialist, but he does that, and he's widely recognized for it, and everybody's excited about his papers, and they tell him that he's doing good work, and so that's a nice balance to saying the world's population is going to collapse and having everybody come up and, you know, criticize you and threaten you and, and so forth, and I do the same thing. So I work on these things, but I have other areas where I'm, where I'm uh, <coughs> At the moment, one of my things is I'm developing community gardens. I'm, in my community, I'm helping people build gardens and figure out how to deal with pests and insects and which seeds to pick and all this and that. And, you know, and helping little kids, uh, all that stuff. So, I mean, and, and, and people love that. I mean, they don't <coughs> criticize me. They think it's great. And, of course, it has absolutely no bearing on the global problems, but it's a, it's a thing. And now the second thing. What is happiness? Really, I mean, what is it? Happiness, as I understand it, is getting what you want. If you have as much as you want, you're happy. It doesn't matter how much you have. I mean, that we see with the statistics <coughs> I put up there. Getting more money doesn't make you more happy if what you really want is something else, like time with your family or, or whatever. So keep that in mind. Happiness is getting what you want. If you're not happy, it means you don't have as much as you want. And you want to be happy, there's now two possibilities. The automatic response is to try to get more. But it's also possible to want less. I mean, there's two ways to close the gap. And I find it much easier, for the rich anyway, to close the gap by wanting less. And so that's what I do and it makes me happy. <laughs>
This has been a wonderful evening, very memorable, and it's only just started because we're going to continue the discussion outside. Earlier today, Dennis Meadows mentioned that one day when he was 17 years old, he was in Switzerland, and on the way back by boat, he realized something as a 17-year-old, he realized that if you give stuff away, then you become poor. But if you give ideas away, then you stay rich, but you can make others rich. And I think this is something that he's done today for us. I'd just like to thank Dennis Meadows, Libby Robin, Jane Carruthers for this memorable evening. We'll never forget. We'll never fold our arms the same way again in the future. And <laughs> we'll remember the butterflies and German happiness and all of that. Um, and uh, so I want to thank the audience also for your questions. and. Um, Matteo and uh, Yolanda and Agnes and Shrabana for collecting the questions and hope to see many of you again for our next lecture in January 2013. So this is also a wish for a good start in 2013. Thank you very much.